looking today at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. And so what I'll do is I'll begin reading here at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 and 2, give you, a, as I normally do, a prolonged introduction, lay a, a groundwork for you, and then we'll move into the verses before us. And we're only going to cover up to verse 7. And the reason, uh, part of that reason is, is because um, on the 25th of this month, a couple of weeks from now, um, I have a, a surgery scheduled uh, where they're going to be giving me a, a brain transplant. I'm looking forward to it <laughs> very much. It's about time. Uh, actually, I have to have a surgery on my left eye, and so uh, I have a cataract, and uh, it's uh, gotten to the point where I'm not real comfortable driving at night um, because my right eye has glaucoma, and so I'm kind of flying blind. Mary's been having a great time with me. It's, you know, by the time she gets home, her hair is straight out like this. You know, she looks like Bride of Frankenstein. So, but we will, uh, I will be having to take a couple of days off. And uh, they had the, the surgery, the, the closest surgery time that they could give to me is on a Wednesday. And so um, we'll have a, a wonderful guest speaker. Uh, and all of that, but I will be planning on, unless something happens between now and then, uh, having surgery on uh, the 25th of this month, just letting you know. Hopefully, I'll be able to be back, um, you know, soon after that. As a matter of fact, I should be able to be back within a couple of days, but I can't that day. So there, I said it. So let's begin reading together. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, therefore, be imitators of God as dear, as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So we're looking at, since chapter 4, what has been called the walk of a believer. I mentioned to you that when we began to look in chapter 4 at the believer's walk, that the word walk speaks of a lifestyle. When you see, when you see the word walk in reference to the way, uh, in reference to Christians, and it speaks concerning our walk, obviously that speaks of our behavior. Uh, in Scripture, the idea of ordering our steps or walking carefully is often spoken of, and that's because believers are to live in a way that is aligned. It's aligned with the will of God. And because we are believers, we understand that God is the one who guides us in our lives. Like it says in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 23, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. So the believer understands that his steps are directed of the Lord. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and through the word of God, he directs us, he leads us. Well, Paul has been writing. He's been writing concerning what is called the walk of the believer. And he's pointed out that who we are in Jesus informs us in the way that we should live. He said that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. And because we are seated in heavenly places in Christ, we're to live a life that reflects that. It's got to be different. You see, before we were saved, we walked according to the course of this world. And that's because we were captives, he has said, of Satan and disobedient to the things of God. He had said in chapter 2, verse 2 of Ephesians, he said, You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedient. It, disobedience. So instead of living as sons of disobedience, he's, he's teaching us that believers are to walk in a way that pleases the Lord. Now, when he was writing to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1, this is what he said to them. He said, finally, then, brothers, we ask and encourage you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us how you must walk and please God as you are doing, do so even more. So you've received instructions how you are to walk and to please God. So the walk of the believer is intended to be pleasing to him. Now, to please God refers to the idea of willing service to God, not only willing service to God, but also willing service to others. 
It pleases God when instead of serving ourselves, the Bible teaches that we actually enjoy serving him as well as serving other people. And because we desire to please God, believers will have a different kind of life. So Paul had gone on here in the book of Ephesians to give identifying marks of the one who is walking with God. He had said in chapter 2, verse 10, that the believer, because who they are in Christ, will walk in good works. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he said the believer, because of who he is, walks worthy of the calling. Now in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says that he saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So we're walking worthy of the calling, which is a holy calling that produces a holy life. When he spoke in chapter 4, verse 17 concerning this, he said, we are not to walk in the futility of our minds. That's because we once were in spiritual darkness. We were living in an imaginary reality, but God had illuminated us, and we no longer are walking in darkness. Like it says in 2 Samuel twenty-two twenty-nine, where it says, you are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord illumines my darkness. So we no longer walk in the futility of our minds in an imaginary reality. As we continue on in Ephesians 5, you'll see in verse 8 that uh, believers are light in the Lord's. And so he says, so walk as children of light. Again, we who once lived in darkness are now children of light. And Philippians 2.15 says that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So God's calling to us in our walk is to actually illuminate, to, to walk in his light and to actually expose by our lifestyles. And we'll see this uh, as we continue through chapter five. We, we illumine, we reveal, we actually uh, are able to expose the works of darkness by the life that we live. When we get to verse 15, uh, chapter 5, verse 15 of Ephesians tells us we walk, and this is an interesting word. I don't know if you use this word today. I didn't. I'll use it right now. Circumspectly. Most of us didn't walk, a, you know, walk up to somebody this morning saying, uh, I'm going to get a cup of coffee. And by the way, are you walking circumspectly? That's not a, a word that we use very often. But when you use that word, and again, when we finally get there next week, hopefully, um, the word circumspectly is an interesting word. It's, it, it, it actually speaks of being on the alert, walking carefully, being aware of your surroundings. You're walking aware of those things. You're alert, but you're also walking in an accurate fashion. You're aware of dangers. So you live properly and you live wisely. We'll look at that next time we're together. Well, here in chapter 5, verse 1, as we just read, we are commanded to be imitators of God. And we're to, notice what he says, we're to, in verse 2, walk in love. And so we'll be looking at that today. In chapter 4, Paul described the life of a real Christian, a genuine believer. In chapter 4, he said we walk in humility. He said we walk in gentleness. We walk in long-suffering. He said Christians lovingly bear with one another. Christians do our best to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In chapter 4, he said, remember, you are united, both Jew and Gentile, in Christ, and therefore you're one. So exercise your spiritual gifts. And through proper teaching, you are being equipped for works of service. He said, avoid false teachings, speak the truth, but do so in love. As we looked at that chapter, he said, we are part of the body of Christ. And because we are equipped by the word of God and the spirit of God, we're to do our share. He said, we've been taught the truth because the truth is in Jesus Christ. And because we've been taught the truth, it's changed the way that we live. So we put off the old man. We're renewed in the spirit. We've been created in true righteousness, created in true holiness. That's changed our lives. We no longer lie to one another. We no longer give in to improper anger. He said we no longer steal. The way that we speak has also been transformed. We don't use profanity. We don't use improper speech. We don't use sexual innuendo. 
Instead, we speak words of edification. We impart grace to one another. And this grace that fills our lives makes it possible to share the gospel with others. In Colossians 4, verse 6, he said it like this. Let your conversation, speaking of your way of life, be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So instead of bitterness that leads to malice, believers put on kindness. We become tenderhearted. We begin to forgive one another, and that's because God in Christ has forgiven us. All of this goes into the introduction of chapter 5, verse 1, because as he has been sharing all of these things, he has now come to this point where he says in verse 1 of chapter 5, therefore, because in light of all of these things, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. Since God has forgiven us of all of our sins, we are to imitate him. When he says be imitators, that word imitator in the original language actually speaks of someone who mimics. It speaks of imitating his actions, mimic his actions, mirror his actions, mirror his actions, his speech and his motivations. Now, sometimes our kids reveal the depth of their love for us when they say things to us that have a personal content. I think that as a father, any father in this room, or perhaps as a mother, any mother in this room, would be blessed if, if your father, if your son approaches you one day and says to you, Dad, I want to be just like you. Now, if your son walks up to mom and says, I want to be just like you, you've got a problem. But if he, if he comes and says, Daddy, I want to be just like you, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing. Dad, I want to be like you. But I think most of us as fathers would probably respond with joy that, that perhaps I've impacted my, my son. But I've always been the one who says, I don't want you as good as me. I want you better than me because that's what a father's heart for a child should be. Don't be like me. Be better. And if the, the little girl approaches mama and says, mama, I want to be just like you, that's a compliment. And that ought to also be something that inspires a mother to live a life that that little girl can mimic so that she can be a woman of God, a woman of prayer, a woman of virtue. Those kinds of things, you see. One of the saddest things that I ever have heard is when I was speaking to a young man. Is This happened just a few years ago. And, and he was sharing his heart with me. And he was sharing with me about his dad. And I'll never forget this. I, I thought of this as I was putting together this, this message. I wrote it down. And I'll never forget how, when he was speaking to me, he said to me, I don't want to be anything like my father. Just to hear those words coming from that son. And I had known that son since he was a baby. And I had known his family for all of his young life. And then for him to say to me on the phone, I want you to know that I don't want to be anything like my father. That was one of the saddest things that I think I've ever heard. Because a son ought to want to be like the father. The father ought to be the kind of father that makes the son want to be like him. Well, Paul is saying to us, God is your father. And as his children, imitate your father. Be like him. He says, be imitators of God, mimics of God as dear children. He's your father. Imitate him. And what is the chief characteristic? Well, in verse 2, he says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. So he says, as, as those who are imitating their father, walk in love. And so he speaks concerning that, that chief characteristic of God. You know, he who loves not knows not God, John said in 1 John 4, for God is love. So that's one of those statements concerning God that is very direct and very open. Be like God. Why? God is love. And so when he says walk in love, he's simply saying be like your father who is love. And what is the chief characteristic of love as he's speaking here? Notice he says, as Christ has loved us and, and has given himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smell and aroma. What is the chief element or characteristic of love as is described in this verse? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. 
He says, Jesus gave himself as an offering and sacrifice. When he speaks of offering, normally the word offering in the Old Testament would be speaking of the different offerings that were, that were made in, uh, in, in sacrifices and all. And normally offering is used speaking of a grain offering and, and grain was given as a gift as, in what is called a peace offering. It represented reconciliation between a sinner and God. And so he speaks concerning an offering that Jesus made, a reconciliatory offering, but he also speaks of sacrifice. And the word sacrifice normally speaks of animal sacrifice, and that would refer to his death for us. In John 10, 17 and 18, Jesus said it like this. He said, the reason my father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Sacrifice. Give yourself in a way that's reconciliatory. Give yourself in a way that's sacrificial. So as imitators of God, and we walk in love, and Jesus is our example, Christ loved us and gave himself for us, well, that would simply mean loving God and loving others contains sacrifice and service. Loving God and loving others is shown by carrying acts of sacrifice. We're cleansed sinners. God saved us. And when we understand his sacrifice, and this is a very important point, when we understand his sacrifice for us, then we're able to forgive and care for others. A lot of times, people will say, and I said this recently, people will say, I forgive you, I'm not going to forget, which is another way of saying I really don't forgive you. It's just another way of saying that. Now, sometimes I think that it's wise for us to remember, not in a, in a mean way, mean-spirited way, you know, collecting things so we can point our finger. There's a wisdom in remembering what was done, but there's not a wisdom in still charging that person for offending us. If that person said, forgive me, I was wrong, then we're to forgive them, right? Now, Jesus shows us how to do that. Jesus, Jesus took upon himself our sin, and he, on that cross, was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so when we come to understand his sacrifice for us, then we learn how to sacrifice for others. And we don't take grace and we don't take his salvation lightly. We're, we are cleansed sinners. And our lives reveal that we understand what it cost him to save us. And, and when we do understand that, it actually provokes us to care about other people, especially being aware of the way that we live so that we don't stumble them. One of the scriptures that says this is found in Galatians 5.13. It says, Brethren, you have been called to liberty. Only do not use. Use not liberty an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. So if we imitate God and walk in love, our lives are to be a willing sacrifice. That demonstrates that we are Christians. So he's speaking about walking in love. How is love demonstrated? Verse 3. Interesting how this ties together with what he has just said, because it, verse 3 begins and says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ in God, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Here we go. This is very practical. Hopefully, I can help us all to see it that way. Notice he begins in verse 3, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Let's look at this a little bit at a time. Well, if Christ's love is our model, if we're imitators of God, 
And the model of Christ of sacrifice becomes part of the way we express ourselves, serving and sacrifice, then there are certain things we won't do. We aren't going to take advantage of somebody else. We're not going to use somebody else for our own pleasure. We're not going to do things that God has forbidden us to do, and we're not going to destroy fellowship, and we're not going to destroy people's lives because we desire something with them that was forbidden by God. Fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness is not even to be named amongst us. So if Christ's love is our model, we're not going to use the world's model of love. Remember that the world's kind of love is often expressed in a sexual way. We're not to succumb to this kind of sin. Why is that? Because we now live in a, a family, a community of believers. And this community of believers has been called a holy community because the God that we worship is a holy God. And he said, therefore, be holy even as I am holy. Live a separated life. That means that we learn how to treat one another with respect, courtesy, and concern. That means that we don't, and I'll look at this with you in Scripture in a moment, but that means we don't take advantage of somebody or defraud somebody else because we took advantage of somebody. I'll show you that in Scripture in just a minute. You see, verses 3 and 4 refer to sins, all of which reveal a lack of sacrificial love for other people. All of them do. He speaks of fornication. Fornication is the word pornea. It has various uh, um, iterations, but the, the, it's, it's pornea. But pornea speaks concerning all sexual sin. It, it, it speaks of a variety of sexual sins, and, and it's speaking of a, a sin that is actually uh, stimulated by lustful passion. And he's saying that you are to not have that. You are to avoid that. It shouldn't be named amongst you. There shouldn't be anything called a Christian fornicator. That makes sense, right? The word uncleanness. When he uses that word, it's another word that refers to sexual things. It speaks of immoral thought. It speaks of immoral passions. It speaks of immoral fantasies. And very often, immoral fantasies are stimulated not just by your imagination, but by pornography. And if we think that pornography is a modern thing, we haven't studied history. Pornography and, and erotic statues and art has been part of humankind since the, since the fall, basically. And so he's saying fornication is not to be named. There should be no Christians who are spending the night at the girl's house and speaking to her and saying to her, you know, I'm in love with you. You know, I love you. I, I, you know, and if you loved me, you'd, you'd show me your love for me. A dog. I remember I said this in church many years ago. I'll repeat it right now. It comes to mind. I said, um, when a guy is telling a girl, and I realize that today girls can tell guys this too. It was a time when guys were the, were the um, assailants, if you will. Women today, many do the same kind of thing that we used to say was all about men. But the guy would be saying, baby, I love you. You know, I love you, and I want you. And I want to show you how much I love you. And, and I, I told the guys in the church, I said, no, no, you're, you're not in love. You're in heat. <laughs> and you need to learn the difference. And that's true. You know, because, and I'll show you this in a minute, because fornication has no part in the body of Christ. Uh, covetousness speaks of sexual parasites. It's speaking of those who are greedy for sexual gratification. When he speaks of filthiness, the word filthiness is general obscenity. It speaks of any talk that is degrading. It speaks of sexually inappropriate speech. It's the guy who brings the innuendos, who likes to say the little dirty thing. Uh, he said that's filthiness. When he speaks of foolish talking, foolish talking is another way of speaking. Well, it's literally empty-headed speech, but it's been referred to as someone with a gutter mouth. I don't know if that word's ever used anymore, but gutter mouths. Coarse jesting, 
coarse jesting is turning somebody's words into trash. It's, it's suggestive speech. You see that very often uh, um, in, in, with comedians. They, they use their wit to say improper things. Well, as this is being spoken, and, and, and ask yourself if this is something that perhaps the Lord might be speaking to us as believers, these kinds of things, he, he, he gives to us the insight and the understanding that this is not, verse 3, to be named among you as is fitting for saints. He's saying that these sins, these sexual sins, these things that are of that nature, these, these sins that actually reveal not love but lust, the, these sins that, that are degrading people and taking advantage of somebody's innocence and all, these things should not even be named amongst you. These are not to be the kinds of things that the body of Christ is to be known for. In Romans chapter 6, verse 13, Paul said it like this. He said, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members, your bodies, as instruments of righteousness to God. That's what Christians are called to do. One of my favorite passages that deals with this kind of thing is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. Listen to what Paul says. So very often, people are saying, I wish I knew what the will of God is. Often when they say, I wish I knew what the will of God is, it's, does he want me to go to school? Does he want me to get a new job? Does he want me to move out of state? You know, I wish I knew the will of God. Well, here's the scripture that gives to us the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel, speaking of his body, in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we have forewarned you and testified. God didn't call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us of his spirit. So a young man is dating a young woman. They both profess themselves to be Christians. They both say they love the Lord, and perhaps they both serve God, and, and they're genuine in their faith. And so they're dating, and they make mistakes. I'll, I'll be going through uh, marriage in the family pretty soon and probably uh, share a little bit more about this. This is just a thought that comes to me as I'm, I'm sharing with you. And so he sees the young lady perhaps at church. Maybe they serve together. They get to know each other. He says to her, I'd like to take you out. Would you go out for a cup of coffee after church? And she looks at him. She says, well, why not? You know, she goes out with them. So out they go. They begin to be friends. As they become friends, they begin to walk a little closer. Before you know it, their, their hearts seem to be intertwining. And eventually what happens is he, he takes a step and, and he kisses her goodnight. Well, that one kiss may lead to other things later on. Now he's fighting passion and desire. As he's fighting the passion and desire, because he's a believer, he begins to think of himself as being incapable of fighting off these desires, and, and I can't stop myself. And before you know it, he's convinced her that because they love one another, and after all, there is no, no marriage license in Scripture. You know, love is true love. You don't need to have a pastor perform a ceremony. We can say before God our vows, and we can have relationship. Why can't we? And she agrees with that, thinking that that may be okay. I'm not quite sure. He's been a Christian longer than me. Maybe he knows what he's talking about. And then they enter into an improper relationship. You know, when these guys say, you know, I slipped and fell and. I slipped and fell into sin, <laughs> right? You were walking by the bed and tripped and fell in it, right? I, I, I believe that, yeah. No, you didn't. You made, you made plans because your body began to let you know before the act that you were moving in that direction. So don't try and convince me that you didn't know or you slipped and you fell. You knew where you were going. You just chose to continue. Then you blame her because you say, well, she didn't stop me. See, so that, that you know, I, I'm an old man. I've heard a lot of things. And so with that said... As they, um, have they ventured into that relationship, she gave herself to the guy. 
but they're convicted. It was wrong. We've got to get out of this. They repent. God forgives him. He moves on, goes to a different church. He stays, whatever. Then one day, a young man comes to church. He sees that young lady. And he says, would you like to go out for coffee? And she says, I'm not sure if I can do something like that. Because in her heart, she's still hurting over what happened. But he treats her like a lady. He loves her. He honors her. He cherishes her. He doesn't make improper advances. He doesn't use sexual innuendo. He doesn't take her places that they ought not to go. He walks her to the door, gives her a kiss on the cheek, or maybe not at all. She goes in the house. She's safe with him. For you know what? She's in love with him because he treats her the way she wanted to be treated all along. He treats her as a lady, as a prized possession. And then one day he says to her, I'm in love with you, and I want to marry you. And she says to him, I'm in love with you. Do you have anything you need to share with me that will help me to understand where we're at together now? And the young lady says, well, I had another guy in my life. This is what happened. And the guy, he loves her. He, you know, he said, well, you know, it's under the blood. You know, I love you anyway. You know, and I want to be the man you should have. And she is so touched because the guy cares for her like that. But this other Christian, the one who took advantage of her, defrauded his brother. Because the one who took advantage of that young lady took from her husband that which belonged to him. That was her purity. That's what Paul is talking about. You should not defraud your brother. What do you mean? You're taking from him that which does not belong to you. It belongs to him. And when you have an improper relationship, you're taking from the people who should be the one flesh, and you're interfering in the work God wants to do in that relationship because the sin that was performed is forgiven, but sometimes the scars stay for a long time. Now, some women don't have scars, and some men don't either because they say, Praise God, I've been washed and bless the Lord. But others have a tender heart and a tender spirit. It's one of the reasons why Christians should not take advantage of other Christians. That's one of the reasons why a husband, a young man, should be very careful in his dating relationship as well as the young lady. My sister-in-law, Patty, Marie's sister, Patty, Patty met a young man, and brought him to this church. He gave his heart to the Lord. I don't remember if he gave his heart here or had given his heart to Christ, and she brought him to church. But she, Patty's not just my sister-in-law. Patty's, to me, my sister. I mean, I love her like my own blood. I love her. She's very dear to me. And Patty was speaking to me, and she, she had grown to love this man, and... and uh, she told me she wanted to marry him, and he had asked her to get married. And as we were talking, she shared something that I was able to share on their wedding day. And it was this. In their entire dating relationship, they never kissed. The first kiss that she ever had from Matthew was when he kissed her, and I had pronounced them husband and wife. You may kiss your bride. And I said, briefly. <laughs> That's a wonderful story. She's not the only one who has it because she, as a believer, had remained pure and she was able to, with him, present to him that which belonged to him as a husband, you see? And there's a beauty to that. Again, not everybody has a testimony like that. And again, many of us have entered into improper relationships and know the pain of that. This is no condemnation. But God's word teaches us purity matters. And so let this kind of sin not be named amongst you. Let it not be even mentioned as an attribute of that Christian community. Why? Because God has saved you 
So don't defraud your brother. And God has given you his word and the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice what he says in verse, uh, verse 5. He says, this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Well, somebody says, that doesn't seem fair at all. Christian standards are unbelievable and they're rigid. You've got to be kidding me. I've had people say this, but it's interesting. You also find it in Scripture. But I've heard people say that sex is natural. It should be enjoyed as much as is possible. But that's something that the early church dealt with. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, it reads, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. That was a saying during that time. If you have a natural impulse, if you're hungry, you eat. If you have a sexual desire, you fulfill it. Food for the stomach, the stomach for food, it's natural. They go together. And so Paul had to deal with that. Foods for the stomach, stomach for foods. But he goes on to say, but God will destroy both it and them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he says in verse 6, he says, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Let no one deceive you. Don't let people ensnare you with empty words that are vain and devoid of truth. You see, there's always going to be friends arguing that this sin is not really that bad. I, I, I can tell you, again, I've pastored this church pretty soon, 41 years. And, and I can tell you, over the years, I've had more than one conversation with, with young people, and usually it's the young, not to say that the old don't do this, but the young. And, uh, and, and they have all kinds of ideas as to why it's unreasonable not to, not to be with this person. And they, and they say things like, well, we need to know if we're compatible. As far as I know, God created you to be compatible. You don't need to experiment to find that out. You are compatible. No, it isn't, a it isn't a game. It isn't something you play with. It isn't something like that at all. But they'll have friends. And I've had them. I still remember this young woman in our fellowship. It's been 30 years, so I can say it. She said to me that, uh, that her friend had said, um, why aren't you sleeping with your boyfriend? She said, because I've been sleeping with mine, the girl said, and I am no different than before. I'm the same woman now. Well, that's because before she wasn't a safe person and she was still an unsafe person. And she didn't have a conscience and she had no conscience as it pertains to this kind of behavior. So of course you don't feel any different because you never had any morals related to that kind of thing. Whereas the young Christian girl, she did. And for her, she eventually entered into an improper relationship to my sorrow because she listened to her ungodly friend instead of the word of God. Let no one deceive you. Every one of us in this room, I don't care if you're old like me or young, every one of us in this room has had one or two people in our lives that try to influence us to do the wrong thing. Maybe you were the one who influenced other people. We've all been in one form or another influenced or influencers, right? We have been. But to influence somebody to sin. I remember this young woman who had, had shared how that she had a friend who was saying, go ahead and do it. You'll be no different. I've been doing it, and it's no problem with me at all. I don't feel any different. And the young girl who was a virgin who didn't do anything said, you know, any time I want, I can become like you, but you can never again become like me. And I thought that was wise, because it's true. I can become like you, but you never again can become like me. And you enter into improper relationships God created us, male and female, to replenish the earth, to populate the earth. And he did so, one of his intentions, that he might have godly offspring. His desire was proper relationships in marriage where the husband and the wife worship him and raise children to do the same. And so that happens when you value who you are as a Christian, the temple of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God dwells in you. So when somebody speaks to you and says, it's no big deal, you Christians, come on now. Yeah, I mean, don't be so puritanic. You're, you're just, you don't understand what life is all about. Well, no, that's, that's not true. We do understand. And when God warns us not to do something, we're very careful to, to heed his, his counsel. My mama used to teach me to stay away from fire for a good reason. 
fire burns. And yet I've shared this before. Some of you haven't heard this, so I might as well say it. It comes to mind. Uh, my mom was a smoker until she got saved. My mom smoked for over 40 years, and then she got saved and never... She gave it up. The Lord took the desire for cigarettes from her. It was a real testimony of how the Lord had changed her life. But my mom used to like to smoke, and because I, I, I liked to, my mom, I thought my mom was cool, especially when she put these long cigarettes in her mouth, would turn on the fire, the burner, and she would put her mouth there, and she, my mom would, you know, just take a hit off that, and, and, the, and it would turn bright red, and then the smoke would waft into her eyes, and she'd kind of have these heavy lids, and my mom was so cool. At least that's what I thought. I said, my mom, you, you are so cool, and so... So I, I wore a pompadour, and I used to spray my hair with, with uh, Aquanet, and uh, <laughs> that's a blast from the past. And, and so I had this 53 Hudson kind of hairdo right here. It was all round and everything, and I had this cigarette, and I turned on that burner because I smoked, and I, I turned on the burner, and, and it caught my hair on fire. I'll, I'll never... <laughs> it, it just went up like that. I had the first afro in Norwalk. It just, it just went like that. So I learned at an early age that my mom was not trying to, to make my life hard. She was trying to protect me from something stupid. And so when God says to us, don't do this, it's not because he's making our life difficult. It's because he's preserving us from pain. It's because he wants us to be like him. You know, somebody once asked me, they, they said, um, they said, they, well, Ashley said this to me. I was on the phone with them. They were speaking, and, and she said this. She said, my friends say that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. And because the blasphemy of the Spirit is the unpardonable sin, that means I can live, this is an actual conversation, that means I can live with my boyfriend and still go to heaven because I'm not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. I'm only sleeping with him. Well, someone who continues in sexual sin is revealing something about their spiritual state. In 1 John 3, 9 and 10, John said it like this. He said, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So when somebody uses, quote unquote, the grace of God as a cover for their sin, they're revealing they don't know what the grace of God is. John says you cannot continue in sin. That doesn't mean that you're going to be sinlessly perfect. It means that that lifestyle is not your lifestyle. You, you will. We all fail. All of us do, especially John. We all fail. <laughs> but we don't live in that way. That isn't the way we are. We don't live that way. We, we repent, we sorrow, we ask God for forgiveness. He repairs us, restores us, moves us on. But somebody who sins with no sense of it being wrong, John says is revealing they don't know the Lord. And when someone continues in sin with no grief, it often reveals they aren't saved. You see, the one who continues practicing sin doesn't understand the grace of God. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, this is what Paul writes. He says, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. There are plenty who will go out there and convince you that it's okay. Many years ago, when we used to be on Maple Street in the earlier, earlier, you know, over 30 years ago in Ontario, I was teaching 1 Corinthians. And I had gotten to chapter 6. I gave the passage, read it like I just did, shared a few things, moved on. I got into a conversation a couple weeks later with a young woman who approached me, and this is what she told me. I'll never forget our conversation. She said, Pastor David, she said, I was in the Bible study for the very first time going to church, 
And I came with my girlfriend. She was a lesbian. She said, I came with my girlfriend. She said, as you read that passage, I sat there and I listened to what was read and, and the explanation. And so we went home. We were living together. She says, we went home. And, and I said, did you hear what the Bible says concerning our relationship? And her girlfriend said to her, oh, that's his opinion. That's what he's thinking. That's, that's outdated. That stuff doesn't pertain to today. But this young lady began to think, and she read it again. She said, I read it. I started thinking about it. I read it. I thought, it seems pretty clear to me. It says that they won't inherit the kingdom of God. And we were uh, practicing uh, same-sex uh, relationships. She said, it seemed pretty. She says, I want you to know what I did. I said, what did you do? She says, she says I gave my heart to Christ, and I moved out of the house because I want to follow Jesus Christ because I don't want to be deceived I want to be in the kingdom of God. You see, the truth does set you free. So many times people say, oh, no, once they're that way, always that way. That's simply not true. God can make you into a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, that's a wonder, he says it. Behold, all things become new. You may have one time been, but you are no longer. You might have been an angry person, but you're no longer. Why? The Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Have the joy of God. You were an alcoholic at one time, but no longer. Why is that? Because you're not drunk with wine. There's excess in that, but you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And I don't need that anymore. You must have been, one time you were filled with hate. You were a violent person, but now you have peace and joy. Why? Because God made you into an entirely new person. See, that's what the gospel does. And that's why we have to be careful not to be deceived. God can change any life. He can when you yield to him. Remember this, your spiritual advisor is not always your pastor. It may not even be your parent. Your spiritual advisor often is a podcast influencer or it's your best friend. So be careful who you allow to influence you in your life. In Psalm 1, 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Now, you can become compromised, and you can become vulnerable to the draw of sin, kind of like Abraham's nephew, Lot. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, Peter writes that God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. He entered into a place of compromise and ended up in Sodom. But he was delivered by God. But his heart was grieved daily by what he saw. You don't want to be a compromiser. Therefore, verse 7, do not be partakers with them. Do not fellowship with those who speak and live in this way. Do not be influenced. Why? Well, the Bible makes it clear. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You become like the ones you fellowship with. We'll close with one last thought. Remember, Many have discovered this sexual sin is bondage. And Jesus said that whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. So the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Like any other sin, Jesus can set you free from it. You admit it. Like Peter said, in Luke 5, 8, Peter said to Jesus, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Oh, Lord, admit it. Confess it. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just, just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Repent from it. Revelation 3, 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, and therefore be zealous and repent. Seek God for power, because God said he would give us of his powerful Holy Spirit. And, and, and remember your spirit may be willing, your flesh is weak, so you need the power of God. And then finally, seek fellowship and accountability. I discovered, and I'll close with this last thought, as a young believer, how easy it is for me to live one way in front of people in church and another way when I'm by myself. I discovered that, I discovered that as a young believer. 
how easy it was for me to appear in one way when in fact my heart was somewhere else. And so for me, what happened, it was biblical, is I came to realize I need accountability. I need somebody in my life, a friend or a brother, who can, I can be honest with, that I can say, I'm dealing with something, I need your prayers. One of the things that I think many people in churches like this, one of the things that they deal with is the fact that they isolate themselves, and when they isolate themselves, they're more prone to fall and to fail. Get involved. Get in a group. Become part of the women's group. Become part of the men's group. Serve the Lord. Have fellowship with men. Develop relationships. I am telling you, and I wish I could tell you more about it, but I'll tell you this. It was when I began to develop relationships with the fellas, with the guys, that I could be real with and honest with, that I could say, this is where I'm at. Please pray for me. That my life took a turn for the better. When I was alone, I could hide things. But when I had friends I was accountable to, I couldn't. And that helped me to develop the self-discipline that was necessary for me to be able to walk with the Lord and have integrity. Because integrity is often measured not by the things one does in front of somebody, but the things they do when they think no one's watching. And so for me, I have asked the Lord to help me to act as if people are watching me at all times, that my life is real so I can have a real integrity, not just the facade or the appearance of it. Develop friendships. Develop prayer partners. Have somebody that you know in your life that you can call and say, listen, I don't want to go into details. I'm struggling. Can you pray for me? I am telling you, God has used that in my life. And all these years, for so many, I've been able to walk straight with him because I fear him, but I have loving brothers too. And the number one thing in my life is I want to be, and this is the truth, I'll close with this, that's the truth. I want to be the man this woman deserves, my wife deserves. She deserves the best man. I want to be that man. That's the truth. That's the truth. I believe my wife deserves the best man. I will be that best man because I don't want her to ever think she should have married somebody else. I want her to be happy with the one she married. So I live in such a way that I will be her, her hero. I will be that man because that's what really matters. Everything else flows from that. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I want to walk with integrity. And I don't want to be guilty of the sins that we're to avoid. Father, I ask that you would work in us.